As we start to mix color, it becomes really important to understand basic terminology and what these terms mean when we're describing color. More importantly, if we have an understanding of different characteristics of color that these terms describe, then it's easier for us to understand what we're doing as we're mixing and changing color and what we want to mix and how to change that color. Hue is defined as the common name for a color. That's our first term that describes a general characteristic of color. But before we even pursue that a little further, let's think about what is the difference between the word color and hue. As you look at these two grids, how many different colors do you see in each one? This isn't a trick question. There are nine different colors in each grid. But when we ask ourselves how many different hues do we see in each of the grids, the answer is a little different. We still see nine different hues in the grid on the right. But on the grid on the left, we see only one hue. All of those colors are made from red. So what we see here is that color describes a very specific color, hue, value, saturation, and temperature. And hue describes a very common or general way of thinking about a color. There are very few hues where there are literally millions of colors. Now, there have been lots of color wheels that have been created uh, through the study of color. But when I'm mixing color with pigment, I'm thinking about uh, 12 basic hues. So we have our primary hues represented in the center of red, blue, and yellow. Those primaries, of course, mix to make secondaries, violet, orange, and green. And when we mix a primary and a secondary together, we get a tertiary. We get red violet, blue violet, blue green, yellow green, yellow orange, red orange, and red violet. Now, this is a simple way to start thinking about the colors that you're mixing, but it doesn't necessarily help us with, say, the names of pigments. As we work with cyan, magenta, and yellow as our pigments, those are also certainly colors and their hues, but it helps me to kind of narrow it down to these 12 as a starting place. The next characteristic of color is value, and value is defined as the lightness or darkness of a color. As we look at these two grids, we see the one on the left is a monochromatic grid. It has one hue. All of those specific colors are blue. And on the right, we have no hues. It's an achromatic grid of black, white, and neutral grays. When we squint at these, we do see that each square on the blue side matches up with each square on the achromatic side in terms of value. So in other words, the lightness or darkness is the same whether we are using a blue, a red, a green, or in this case, black, whites, and grays. Here we see the famous painting Nighthawks by Edward Hopper, and we have a black and white photograph of that image. In other words, we have taken out or removed all of the uh, aspects of color except for value. And value, I find, is one of the most powerful characteristics of color that I have under my control when I'm mixing. Many artists think about just using value first 
and then they think about what specific hues or colors should those values be, right? In other words, if I'm mixing a green, how light or how dark do I want that green? And where do I want that in context to say other colors that are next to it? Value, like all aspects of color, is relative based on context. And what you see in front of you is a little value scale that has a constant of a white and a black in the each individual square. Our perception of how light or how dark each of those little ovals is relative to their background changes because they are influenced by their background value. Now we still see separation between each of those ovals and the background, but in some cases the separation is greater and in other cases the separation is less so, it's weaker. Now another thing that's happening here is if you look at the gray strip in the middle, right, it looks a little darker on this end and it looks a little lighter on this end, on the left side. What's happening here is that that gray bar is surrounded by dark values above and below, or it's surrounded by lighter values above and below. And that influences how we see the gray in the center. And even when that value gets close or exactly the same to the values above it, it disappears. It becomes an implied shape. Now if I move these two white bars and hide those values, we see that gray strip is actually one solid gray. Physically, it's not different. But when we surround it by either a lighter or a darker value, our perception of that value changes. And that's why we see the strip appear darker on the right and lighter on the left. The next characteristic of color is saturation. And saturation has many other synonymous terms. Intensity certainly is one, chroma, purity, etc. Saturation describes the brightness or dullness of a color. Here we've got two grids of four colors each. We see a violet, a blue, a yellow, an orange. But there's something different about one of these. Can you put your finger on what the difference is? Stare at these two for just a bit it seems subtle, but there's one thing that's different. If I change the one on the right a little more, now do you see the difference? The blue has changed saturation. It has become less bright and more dull. Right? So if we think about value on a scale from light to dark, saturation or intensity on a scale is bright to dull or pure to gray or saturated to desaturated. So if I move it back, now can you see the blue on the right is just a little duller than the blue on the left. Nothing else has changed. In fact, another way to describe these little grids is that, and particularly the one on the left, the violet, the orange, the blue, the yellow, they're all really bright and they are kind of screaming at us. And when I change the saturation of the blue, notice how much more calm it feels in comparison to the yellow, violet, and orange. This is a scale of very highly saturated blue to very desaturated blue. You can see we've removed 
the blueness, the purity of the color increasingly as it moves right, and that blue has gotten duller and duller and more desaturated. We Another thing is that we haven't changed the value at all. We haven't made it lighter or darker. So if you back away from your screen a little bit and squint at it, it should look like it's almost one continuous rectangle, right? It just feels a little grayer on one end and it feels brighter on the other end. Value and saturation have a relationship, as do all these terms, and I think it's probably the most confusing for people because although value and saturation are different, they do have a relationship where if you change value, you're also changing saturation. But as you can see here, we can change saturation without changing value. This takes a little experience to understand. Our last characteristic of color is temperature, right? And I think about this on a scale as well, from hot to cold. Now, when we think about color temperature, it's usually in the abstract, and it usually is all of the warm colors are red, orange, and yellow, and all of the cool colors are green, blue, and violet. It's not quite so simple. As you look at the colors in the square on the left, which one is warm and which is cool? Do you experience them as hot or cold, warm, cool, or neutral? Color temperature is a little tricky. I find that um, uh, there are many factors that influence how we see and feel color temperature. One of those might even be as simple as where you grew up and what the climate was like and what colors you were used to seeing and associating with temperature. As we look at the square on the left, that orange, yes, is very warm. It's the warmest color in that square. And as it moves towards the bottom right, towards the pink, which is essentially, again, a light red, it tends to cool off or neutralize a bit. So it's not quite so hot. In fact, in this context, I would even describe it as feeling cool in comparison to that orange. The same is true of the square on the right, where now we have two traditionally thought of cool hues, green and blue. But in this context, the green feels much warmer than the blue which feels much cooler. As with all things in color, context is really important. Here we've got two scales where I've used almost the same violet in each on, on the same right end side. And on the top scale, it feels like it's the coolest color. But in the bottom scale, it feels like maybe it's the warmest color. So again, our perception is based on context. So in summary, the criteria that we have to control when we're mixing color is what hue do you want it? What value should it be? What intensity or saturation should it be? And what temperature are you after? As we look at this little illustration. We have a series of reds. All of these are red. They're one hue. But again, they're all different colors because we have different lights and darks or values of red. We have different brights and dulls of red. And we have different warms and cools of red.